Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third talk in our Bio5 Precision Wellness in the Time of COVID-19 event series. My name is Jennifer Barton, and I'm the director of the Bio5 Institute. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Bio5 connects and mobilizes top researchers to find creative solutions to humanity's most pressing in health and environmental challenges. Since 2001, this interdisciplinary approach has been an international model of how to conduct collaborative research and has resulted in disease prevention strategies, promising new therapies, innovative diagnostics and devices, and improved food crops, and includes the precision, nutrition, and wellness as initiatives as one of its focus areas. Tonight's event is a larger and the larger series are part of the Bio5 Institute's Precision Nutrition and Wellness, Wellness Initiative. The mission of this initiative is to determine and optimize the state of health of individuals in order to predict and prevent disease and increase overall quality of life. This is achieved through integration of scientific research, next generation technologies, and personalized nutrition and lifestyle design. We also value the power of education in promoting health. So in this series, we've chosen speakers that are at the top of their scientific game, but who are also relatable to all of us joining the conversation tonight. So tonight, I'm especially proud to present Dr. Ski Chilton, Director of the Precision Nutrition and Wellness Initiative and Bio5 Associate Director. Dr. Chilton is well known for his passion to provide people with solutions to overcome physical and emotional suffering so that they can live better, more joyful lives. He's a successful researcher, innovator, author, and inventor in the areas of inflammation and precision nutrition and wellness. Audience members are welcome. Please type your questions throughout the talk in the Q&A box located at the bottom of the toolbar on your screens. We'll be sure to leave time for questions at the end of the presentation. Go ahead and type them in at any time. Dr. Chilton, we're delighted to have you with us this evening. Please go ahead. Uh, well, Dr. Barton, uh, I, I'm especially happy to be introduced by you. you. You have been an amazing leader and continue to be, and, and actually one of the reasons, one of the major reasons that I made the trek from North Carolina. So thank you so much for your leadership. and. Uh, I want to say hi to everyone. I know I have friends and family in North Carolina, at Wake Forest, uh, at Stony Brook. Uh, I just uh, welcome. I hope your your evening is is really as beautiful as the evening we're having here in Tucson. So I'll go ahead and share, and we'll get started. Just a second. Okay. Wait just a second. Okay, this technology is not going to get the best on me. Uh, again, welcome, welcome to uh, tonight's event. Uh, we're especially honored and I'm especially honored and, and to be representing this group of researchers which really have over the last nine months to a year searched for underlying mechanism, root causes that are that are leading to lethal disease in, in, in COVID patients. And we'll present some of that work tonight. I apologize, it's, it's uh, I'm having a little, Dr. Chilton, if you'll just yes. open up, perfect. You okay. can just go back now. Yeah, I apologize. Okay. 
This is just a reminder of how important this issue is. Um, as of this morning, um, COVID had led to 581,000 deaths in this country. The US has 19% of global deaths despite only having 4.25% of the world's population. Um, in the US, about 2% of individuals who get COVID eventually die. Just to kind of put those numbers in perspective, um, uh, the US, the deaths in the US exceeds World War II, the Korean War and the Vietnam Wars all combined. And I particularly want to start out this, this presentation tonight by acknowledging those individuals who provided samples for, for this science. And I believe this is very sacred work because many of these people died. So it's really, I, 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 I want to acknowledge that as we start. So if you look on the left side of this figure, what you see is you see about 40% of individuals are asymptomatic when, when they get COVID. The others fit into this mild and moderate category, and then about 20% get severe disease. A, a proportion of those severe uh, folks end up dying. And that percentage has dramatically changed uh, over the course of the last year and a half. At the beginning, if you look at mortality, you see that about 11 and a half percent of, of the severe patients were, were, were dying or, or not severe, but all COVID patients. And, and now you can see that we're doing a lot better and that's around 4%. But the key question that this talk addresses is, why do some people die of this disease and why do others um, have severe disease and recover? Uh, this is a, um, a graph uh, from Nature Medicine and it, it basically goes over the types of, of COVID disease. Uh, once SARS-CoV-2 infects, individuals can get mild symptoms and if they get mild symptoms, they typically return uh, to baseline. And we'll talk about long COVID here in a minute. If you're getting in stage two, you see, you see long infiltrates, you see a sign of pneumonia. And again, you see most of these individuals return to baseline. Some of these individuals get pneumonia with hypoxia and I'm not an MD, so I'm using MD words, but, but, but again, that just means they're having great difficulty uh, breathing and, 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 and again, may end up on a ventilator. Again, the, the very serious individuals get stage three of this disease. They get adult respiratory distress syndrome. They get shock. They get multiple organ failure. Some return to baseline. Some return to a a baseline that is not anywhere near the baseline at which they started. And of course, uh, a number of, of these folks died. So the real question of this work is, what are the underlying molecular mechanisms that cause some people to die? So this slide again is from Nature Medicine. And, and once again, what this slide shows is that initially you get an infection, a SARS-CoV-2 infection of the lung, but then it moves out of the lung. And once it moves out of the lung, it becomes a multiple organ type disease. And again, it's in the brain, it's in the kidneys, it's in the liver, it's in the GI, uh, it's in the blood vessels, uh, uh, it's in the heart, uh, in the endocrine system, in the skin. So this disease moves in its severe form from the lung, and then it moves to multiple organs. And for those individuals who die, it results from multiple organ failure or sepsis, multiple disseminated uh, failing of, of a whole variety of, of organs. 
Now, this is a, a, a graph that was put together with my, my mentor, my old mentor, uh, Cash McCall. Cash uh, actually served on my PhD thesis committee. Uh, that tells you how long uh, we go back. Uh, but uh, Dr. McCall has forgotten more things about infectious disease than I'll ever learn. He is a great man and a, and a great scientist. And he and I talked about this. And, and what we, you see in this is you get virus that enters the body. Then you get an inflammatory storm. And that inflammatory storm is, divide, is designed to stop the virus. I mean, it is mobilizing the immune system. It's mobilizing every tool in the immune system, every cell in the immune system, every cell signaling system. And again, this is a host or immune defense mechanism. Now, if this gets bad enough, if the storm becomes bad enough, the storm itself can lead to death. But again, without the storm, the pathogen, in this case, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, completely takes over and you die. However, once that phase takes place, there's a second phase and you can see it in blue and it's host tolerance or disease tolerance. And it's what is happening in this phase is your body is trying to withstand the defense that you have mounted. So you have mounted this massive immune response to stop the virus. But that massive immune response not only is killing the virus, but it's affecting the tissues and the organs themselves. And the host, the human, us, we're trying as hard as we can not to allow that inflammatory storm to shut down those organs. So we have a whole variety of, of mechanisms and we shut down our energy in those organs. Uh, again, we do everything we can to allow the pathogen to be fought by the initial immune response, but we still have to survive. We, the human, have to survive not only the pathogen, not only the virus, but we have to survive our response to the virus. And this is a trade-off. And, and again, if you fall above this trade-off, you die of multiple organ failure. And again, that's what so often happens in, in COVID-19. What happens is you're down here, you've had this massive inflammatory storm. Now, all of a sudden, you're turning off your immune set system immunosuppression, you're doing it by reducing energy, and you're trying to recover. At the same time, you're trying to balance pathogen or virus load. And if that balance is not perfect, you die. And again, it, it, is, a, it is a delicate, delicate balance. Now, again, out here, we'll talk about long COVID uh, in, in a few minutes. So, I just show here teeter-totters and the teeter-totters are just designed to say how difficult it is to balance this disease resistance response, this immune response that we humans put forward to kill this virus and then to balance the, what that is actually doing to us as a human host, what our own immune systems are doing to us as a human host. So if disease resistance is incredibly strong and host tolerance, our tolerance is not strong, we die. If disease resistance is not strong, uh, then the pathogen ends up killing us. The virus ends up killing us and host tolerance is really strong, but that's irrelevant. So the idea here is to balance disease resistance and host tolerance. And if we can do that, then we survive. If we don't, then, then uh, this is a train, um, a freight train of inflammation coming our way and this is us and, and we simply don't survive. So what I wanted to do in these first few slides were just to point out uh, how delicate this balance is. So why do people die from COVID? 
Well, I want to uh, I want to say also here at the beginning is to answer a question so complex requires a transdisciplinary team of research. You've got to have uh, doctors, MDs. You've got to have uh, data scientists. You've got to have statistical experts. You've got to have uh, biochemists like myself. You have to have immunologists, and you have to bring these teams together and they're trying to solve a central problem. And you simply, one of the things that so attracted me uh, from North Carolina to the University of Arizona was the data science capabilities and the machine learning and the things that could be put together here. And it really takes transdisciplinary teams. I wanna point out a couple of really important people, uh, Maurizio, uh, Del Poeta uh, and Karen Yu are critical people at Stony Brook. And these individuals provided us with our first 365 blood samples from individuals with COVID. And, 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 and they were just critical in making this work happen. And from those 365, uh, 127 met our criteria. It was a it was a chaotic data set and the blood was being taken at different times and 127 fit into our data set. Now, the first thing we did was something called metabolomics and lipidomics. Now, uh, you've heard so much about genomics and genomics is, is very important, but it's a long way from the patient. Transcriptomics, long way from the patient and it's about 150,000 transcripts. Proteomics, a million different types of proteins, again, not so close to the patient. But what metabolomics does is it measures thousands of metabolites that are circulating in your blood. And these thousands of metabolites that it measures, basically there are 3,000 metabolites that control all the major networks within your body. So if we can measure these metabolites, we can look to see what are the networks that are being altered that are in each of these conditions. So what we do is we take blood from the patient. Uh, we do, uh, we use this fancy instrument uh, uh, called a LCMSMS. It's, it's, a, it's a very expensive mass spectrometer. It measures about 3000 uh, compounds. We then do high resolution statistical analyses. Uh, we also some data science in here. Uh, we then do some bioinformatics to try to understand what networks are being altered. And then if we understand what networks are being altered, we can begin to understand what is actually leading to mortality in the folks. And again, we're trying to identify molecular signals that are associated with COVID severity, severity and death. And if we're really, really fortunate, we can identify a molecular mechanism or a root cause that's leading to the severity or leading to the death. And that's what we were so fortunate to be able to do in these studies. So once again, blood, blood is going to fancy instrument, fancy instruments generating lots, thousands and thousands of metabolites, a lot of really sophisticated uh, statistics and data science. And then what comes out of this is the biochemistry that I love and I got my PhD in. And so once we get the biochemistry, this tells us what part of the biochemistry is having the effect. So if we're looking at severe patients versus patients who have died, we wanna know what part of this network is being altered in the people who are not surviving, because that tells us what, or potentially tells us what's leading to death. This is a very complicated slide and I'm not gonna go into it in great detail, but I know there's a lot of scientists. So this is uh, in our studies, uh, this is our data, and we, when we looked, uh, I'm sorry, when, when we looked 
between the non-COVID and deceased, you can see that there are metabolites that are very different in the deceased versus the non-COVID. There are metabolites that are very different in the mild versus deceased. And there are a few that are between severe and deceased. And so that's, this is what we were really interested in. What are the metabolites that are causing death and we're, we're not seeing it in severe? And basically what we found was two networks that were being altered. And I'm gonna just let you trust me on this because I'm gonna come back to this in a second. But basically there were two networks, two biochemical networks that we saw in lethal disease that we were not seeing in severe disease. One was the mitochondria was no longer functioning in folks who were dying. Well, that's really important because the mitochondria is the energy for all the organs. So if your mitochondria is not functioning, your organs will not function, you will get multiple organ failure and you'll die. The other thing that we found was this enzyme that I was studying back at Johns Hopkins in the early 90 when I was in the uh, allergy and uh, infectious disease department there and and. And again, this is, was fascinating. I'm gonna come back to this over and over. So this is the last thing I'm going to say about energy function, but one of the things that we were seeing from this metabolomics is those people who are dying, their mitochondria are no longer functioning. And the way we saw that were these short chain uh, acyl carnitines. And basically what that just means is that they're all getting trapped inside the mitochondria and all of these organs, the mitochondria are not functioning. If they're not functioning, they're not generating energy. If they're not generating energy, then the organs are going to die. And again, you can see that here, and this is just one of the acetyl carnitines, one of the ones that get trapped in here. And you can just see big differences between mild and severe and mild and deceased here. And so the mitochondrial were dysfunctional. Again, we looked at the DNA from the mitochondria and you can see that in the deceased, they were much higher. But we also saw something else and, and this was fascinating and this was in our bailiwick. And again, I, I apologize for the complexity of this, but basically what we saw and uh, and I'll just go down here. Uh, uh, and uh, what we saw was a phospholipase. And, uh, and, and it's this guy, and it was a phospholipase A2, or it looked like a phospholipase A2. And what phospholipase A2s do is they cleave a fatty acid from membranes. So they're cleaving these membranes. So if this membrane is in an organ, they're cleaving the membranes. They're cleaving the fatty acids in the membranes and they're punching holes in the membranes. Once you get a hole in a membrane, then the organ, the tissue is no longer going to function. So for some reason, these, these were working on the membranes and punching holes in the membranes. And basically this was the mass spectrometry and it was telling us that it was punching holes or it was cleaving uh, a type of phospholipid called a phosphatidylethanolamine and a phosphatidylserine, but not a phosphatidylcholine. Now that became very important because I'm old and being old, it has very few advantages, but one of the advantages is I'm gonna forget where my car is parked. Uh, I'm gonna forget where my house is but I'm not gonna forget the 400 biochemical steps that metabolize lipids. So this was telling me that there is a phospholipase A2 that is in circulation. And not only is it a phospholipase A2, but it's a secretory phospholipase A2. So what did we learn from the metabolomics? We learned, first of all, that mitochondrial is, is dysfunctional. And in the people who are dying, it's dysfunctional. And so you're no longer able to give energy to those organs. They're no longer able to produce energy and that's going to lead to organ failure and death. The second thing is we saw all of these membranes being hydrolyzed and potentially punching holes in these membranes. 
And again, uh, this, is, this is something that we knew a lot about. I knew a lot about from a long time ago. So we focused here. The universe does conspire. And uh, this is a paper that I published in, a, in the same journal that we have this submitted to, the Journal of Clinical Investigation. And I was at Hopkins for quite a while and I, and I was just frustrated. I'd been working with this dang enzyme all my life and I just couldn't figure out what it was doing and what its true role was. So in exasperation, I published a paper called Will the Real Role of Secretory PLA2 Please Stand Up? Uh, and uh, I was asked to do this editorial and, and I published it, but again, it would visit me 20 some years later. So why is this enzyme circulating to begin with? What, what is its function? Why would, why would it do that? Why would you put something out there that's going to punch holes in membranes? Well, the reason is evolution. Uh, this, this enzyme's been around 125 million years and I'm gonna tell you in a second, it's in snake venom and it's the active ingredient in snake venom, but it also recognizes bacterial cell walls. So before we had antibiotics, before we had anything, our bodies would release this SPLA2. I'm sorry, it would release this SPLA2. And once it released it, it would hydrolyze all the membranes of the bacteria, punch holes in them, and you got over your bacterial infection. If you had physiological amounts, you would be fine if you didn't make too much. If you made too much, then you started seeing inflammation uh, and, and multiple organ failure, vascular damage, all the things you began to punch holes in very important membranes. So like I said, this is a fascinating enzyme because it's 125 million years old. It has come through evolution. Group 2A, this is a South American rattlesnake. It contains group 2A. Uh, group 2A is the enzyme that we release into our plasma. So evolution has made its way in utilizing this enzyme, whether it was in a toxin to kill uh, animals with a venom or whether it was us releasing it from our cells and killing bacteria. So it's a fascinating evolutionary story. So the next thing we did was we said, okay, is it being released into circulation of the people who are dying? Is this enzyme being released? And if you look up here, this is the non-COVID patients, this is the mild, and this is the severe, and this is the deceased. And you can see a lot more of it in the deceased folks. So it's being released in much higher quantities in the deceased people? Is it still able to eat up membranes? Is it still hydrolytically active? Yes, and that's what this shows. This is the important, if this is the enzyme itself, and this is the concentrations of the enzyme itself, and here's its association with all of these clinical scores that are bad news. So. If you're going to die, you're going to see these clinical scores either going up or going down if it's oxygen saturation or hematocrit or hemoglobin, so it's going down. But what you see is these very tight associations uh, between the amount of this enzyme and these clinical endpoints. Association does not mean causality. Again, the idea then became how do we more closely understand what this enzyme is doing? And how does machine learning work? I tell people I'm the dumbest person in my lab and I have 21 people I think in my lab. The only thing I know is how things, what things can do. So I find really, really smart people to work with me and, and those really smart people use things like machine learning and artificial intelligence to find patterns and make predictions. So we use two types of machine learning. We used a decision tree. A decision tree will, and this is an example, am I out of shampoo? Yes, no. 
If I am, is it raining? Am I going to go to the store? If it's raining, yes. If no, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go to the market. I'm not going to go to the market. But these machine learning decision trees are able to create trees based on the data and based on what it can learn from the data. We also did something called a random forest feature importance analysis. And basically what this does is it takes all of these decision trees. And in this case, it took a thousand decision trees. We ran a thousand decision trees. And then we will pull certain clinical parameters or patient variables out of the decision tree. And we'll see what that does to the decision tree. Did it make it better? Did it make it worse? And utilizing this machine learning, we, we found something that was simply amazing. So we, there were over 80 clinical scores. And, and again, this was done by two incredibly talented uh, data scientists, uh, Guang and Cha. And, and basically, it was given 80 some clinical parameters to pick from. And again, we're having no influence. This is completely unbiased. And it's telling us that if your PLA2 levels, if this secreted PLA2 is above this level of 10 nanogram per mil, 63% of those people die. If it's below it, 100% survive. That was astonishing. That was the, that made my decade. That one observation made my decade. And then if we combine that with, with bond or, or kidney dysfunction parameter, that took us up to 76% that die deceased, or if it was below this 100% surviving. So what the machine learning had done is it had defined the place that this enzyme was playing in the death of these patients. Again, we did another, um, and my box got out of place here, but that's okay. We did another uh, machine learning, a random forest. We run a thousand different trees, uh, a thousand different decision trees. And we would take certain of these 80 clinical parameters out of the trees. And it told us which were most important and see what it put was most important. Levels of SPLA2 and levels of this kidney enzyme. So we were convinced at that point that, that this enzyme was really, really important in causing the death uh, of these people. How's it doing it? Well, this PLA2 is released and it's released into the blood. Um, it's released into the blood. And once it's released into the blood, it just works so if, if tissues or organs are in a bad way, if they're already being disrupted, they're going to flip their membranes inside and out. And this SPLA2 is just going to finish the organ off. Uh, they're going to attack mitochondria because they think mitochondria are bacteria because they have bacterial membranes. Uh, they're going to participate in extracellular vesicles and make a bunch of bioactive molecules and all of this, all of these late responses impact the mortality, simply amplify, and then you've got the freight train moving. The freight train is now going down the track and the little white car is sitting there and with nothing left to do. So again, with this figure that Dr. McCall helped me with, uh, you can see that, that what appears to be happening is with, with this uh, host or disease tolerance, you have this host or disease tolerance, but if this SPLA2, group two SPLA2 is being released, that is enhancing death. And that's what everything, every bit of this data is telling us. This enzyme that was evolved 125 million years ago as a snake toxin, and we utilize it to kill bacteria, it is being released with COVID and it is, we believe, leading to horrible outcomes. We've submitted this paper to the Journal of Clinical Investigation. We've got a wonderful 
We got a great review. We're very encouraged. Uh, and we will now, um, um, the only thing they've asked for, the only thing is replication to do it in, in more COVID patients. And, and, and our colleagues here at the U of A have us a replication so, uh, cohort and, and our colleagues at Stony Brook has, have us a second. So now we'll have three validation cohorts. Uh, and we think uh, with those, we'll, we'll get into this very important journal and it'll be very important. Well, so what you say, what, what can we do about that? What's the, you know, what's the big deal? Well, in 2005, um, up until 2005, there were group two SPLA2 inhibitors that were produced in the pharmaceutical industry. And then they failed in sepsis. And we think they failed in sepsis because they weren't able to stratify the patients the way we would be able to stratify the patients. But these SPLA2 inhibitors are through phase two clinical trials and could immediately go into phase three clinical trials utilizing the stratification techniques that we have discovered. Again, the Army just gave $9 million to a company that was producing this inhibitor, these inhibitors for snake bites, which is just ironic, so, so that uh, they can test them in COVID. Um, the last, very quickly, uh, we, uh, we're all very concerned with post-acute COVID or long COVID. Uh, it affects 33% of people, 10% uh, in a very, very significant way with long-term effects. Uh, the biggest effects are, are fatigue, this profound fatigue, the shortness of breath, anxiety, brain disorders, palpitations in the chest, so, uh, chronic kidney disease, so on and so forth. And with 50 million people in the U.S. and, and, and hundreds and hundreds of millions worldwide, this is going to be a major, major problem. And NIH just put one and a half billion dollars towards studying this. And, and we all collectively put in a grant uh, to study it as well. You know, persistent inflammation ha can do some bad things. And I, I just remind us that, you know, long COVID is not the only thing that where we see persistent inflammation. Persistent inflammation without an apparent cause can do really bad things. The last thing I'll say is just, I, 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 I just keep coming back to this group two secretory PLA2. Does it have a role in post-acute COVID? One of the things that happens with a snake bite in group two uh, PLA, secreted PLA2 is it binds to muscle and nerve cells. And when it binds to muscle and nerve cells, it's taken into those muscle and nerve cells and it goes in and it eats up their mitochondria and takes away their energy and those muscle and nerve cells die. This is a putative mechanism by which uh, we could be getting this profound uh, fatigue and, and muscle weakening that we're seeing. Certainly it's a mechanism that we're going after. I'll end with, there's still many questions. Science is beautiful in that once you answer a question, you, know, you have more. Can we validate uh, is, uh, is the SPLA2 causal or associated? Are there genetics to it? Uh, how's it released and what, from what human host cell? Um, what role does it play in, in COVID-19 disease resistance? If it does, how? Uh, is it released from bronchial epithelial cells? What role is it playing in long COVID? Uh, does it affect nerve and muscle uh, tissue? Uh, and finally, and most importantly, if we can stratify utilizing the tools that we've discovered, will these inhibitors uh, be, we, uh, be magic bullets for treatment? Because right now there is not a specific treatment in the world for COVID. So could this be a specific treatment with proper stratification? Again, um, 
I want to say to the left, we remember all of those who gave their lives and suffered uh, for this work. Uh, we honor this work. This is sacred work. Uh, I, I, I've listed the, the collaborators at the University of Arizona um, uh, in the banner validation set, uh, Stony Brook, uh, Karen Yu, you're my hero. Uh, you went through each one of these patient records uh, hand in hand and, and Maurizio, thank you guys so much. And, and again, all the continued encouragement from my friends and, and, and family uh, at Wake Forest. You'll always be family. And thank you all. Thank you for joining us tonight. And, and I'll be happy to take your questions. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chilton, for your fascinating presentation. Thank you. I really so, appreciate it. <laughs> Um, yeah, we're now happy to take some questions from the audience. I see that some of you have already put questions in the Q&A. Uh, please feel free to continue doing so. I'm going to turn it over to another of our Bio5 Associate Directors, Dr. Michael Hammer, who will moderate the Q&A portion of the evening. So um, please do that and we'll get to as many questions as we can. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, can you guys hear me okay? That was a great talk, Dr. Chilton. And you do have several questions here. So right from the get-go, going back to the innate versus the adaptive immune system, uh, there's a question here. A characteristic feature of COVID is the ability to inhibit or delay the induction of type 1 interferon, which allows viral replication. Uh, viral, viral replication induces more tissue damage resulting in dead cells, which further exasperate inflammation. So the question is, do you think the failure of the innate, innate immunity to kill the virus is part of what leads to the imbalanced response? So where does the innate immune, immune system come in? Well, the innate immune system, of course, is, is, is you know, the, the, the inflammatory or the cytokine storm and the antibody response. And, and uh, the questioner mentions uh, uh, cytokines and, and, and it truly is a balance. I mean, and I, I, you know, humans get it, we get it right most of the time. Um, we don't know what teeter totters it in, in one direction or another. I mean, clearly, it's a confusing disease because we see this inflammatory storm and all of a sudden with the inflammatory storm, everyone at the beginning were going, okay, inflammatory storm, that's what's killing everybody. And then, then we kept looking and, and people go, no, no, it's not an association between the inflammatory storm and death. What, where the real issue, as the, as the questioner is pointing out, is immunosuppression. That's the real bugaboo. And, and it is this balance in which the immune system is trying to balance itself. It does appear that those individuals that go into immune suppression um, are, 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 are at special risk. And I hike a lot here in, in, in Arizona and, and I love the saddles because there, you know, you hike one peak and then there's a saddle to get to the other peak. And in my mind, um, what we may have discovered is what fills in the saddle. Um, you know, what fills in the saddle may be this SPLA2 that just pushes you over the edge because clearly the saddle, the, you know, the inflammatory storm mm. is the first part of the saddle. Uh, uh, the immunosuppression and multiple organ failure is the second peak. But what gets you between those two? What, what is the, the missing molecular or root causes that gets from one to another? Great. There are several questions. Well, first of all, there was another question before we get to PLA2, because a lot of questions about PLA2. But before we get there, you mentioned the mitochondrial dysfunction. 
uh, as one of the two networks that was uh, uh, disrupted. And so there is one question here. Um, what do you think about the, the playing of mitochondrial dysfunction in this scenario? Is it, is it linked to PLA2? Is it its own thing? And, and personally, I wondered if you'd thought of, you know, drugs or in interventions that might in boost mitochondrial function is part of your thinking? It's such a good question. It's such a, and I don't know who asked it, but they were really smart, but uh, it's such a good question because clearly the mitochondria, you know, when mitochondrial, you know, when they poop out, the organ's gonna die because there's no more energy. And that is a telltale sign of host you know, host resistance because it's turning the energy down to try to save itself. However, the, the reason the question is so insightful is that SPLA2 loves mitochondrial membranes. So, you know, it, it thinks they're, you know, as you know, uh, evolution 400 million years ago, you know, mitochondria were engulfed and became the energy cycle, but they were bacteria that were engulfed. So they still have a bacterial membrane. So when SPLA2 sees those mitochondria, they go, ah, that's our favorite thing to chew on. So let's go eat up the mitochondria. Now, there's a whole new field and it's one of the most fascinating things I believe in all of science. It's one of the most fascinating things I've, I've ever seen. And it's how that cells such as platelets and things can go to, for, for example, organs or that are failing and give their mitochondria to those organs. So it's transferring free mitochondria into those organs that are dying and say, I know you're dying. I know you need energy. I know you need respiration. Here, take my mitochondria. Well, what SPLA2 circulating would do would be not so fast. If you're gonna release those mitochondria, we're gonna eat them and we're gonna bust holes in them and we're gonna make them you know, dysfunctional. So, so, so there is definitely a potential connection between the mitochondria just because of their archaeobacterial membranes that the SPLA2 love to chew on. Okay, well, like I said, there are a bunch of questions about PLA2, and I'm going to start with the most basic, and we can work our way up. One of them is asking if it's genetic, and I think maybe we can stop and think about what that might mean. Is it a gene? Is it transcribed? Does it, it, how, would, uh, how would its involvement in, in, in COVID uh, go back to the gene and, and its transcription and what it's doing? And, and is there, are there alterations that occur you know, in the realm of genetics? Boy, these are good questions. Uh, you know, it's on, it's encoded on chromosome one. As you know, gene diet or gene interact, gene variation is what we do, my lab does. So you can bet that we're looking at chromosome one right now. And you're gonna, you can bet that we're looking at, at ancestry-based differences. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking at transcription-based differences you can know that we're focused on that because number one, we don't know what cell is releasing it. We know platelets release it, endothelial cells release it, do, do respiratory epithelial cells. We're gonna check that out. But for me, it's not so much who releases it as much as why is it not controlled? Because studies in the early 1980s showed that in sepsis, if this thing was released and it kept going up, you died, period. If it was released and it started to come back down, you lived, period. That's what our data is saying with COVID. So there's got to be a lot of regulation going on, both in terms of its release its synthesis, its transcription, and, and, then, and, and then taking it back. I mean, as a biochemist, I just feel like I just got my life back because this is, this is what we love to do. 
Good answer, thank you. I think uh, there are several questions here that would relate to the topic of the association versus the cause. And people are asking some really uh, insightful questions here. First of all, what do we know about children making PLA2? And then we can look at the other end of life. So we can look at those that are most affected and most prone to the more severe outcome versus those that are almost not having any, any outcome at all from, from being affected? We know nothing. Um, we, we just don't yet know anything. I mean, I have a favorite hypothesis um, that uh, um, I'm going to work with uh, the Aging Center in Yonko here. I mean, I think SPLA2 increases with aging. I, I think it's probably a critical part of when cells begin to die and necrose. Uh, it's just a way that uh, to, to you know, hasten, hasten the aging process. Uh, but we, have, we, we don't know, as far as children, we don't know. One of the things that, that we have some fascinating preliminary data on, and it's just a few individuals, uh, but a Manya visiting scientist in my lab who just got here from Serbia has shown in some initial samples that the vaccination seems to markedly reduce circulating levels of SPLA2. So, so, so maybe that's a mechanism by which uh, the vaccination has its effects, but there's just so much that we don't know. Well, you just uh, guessed one of the questions, actually. One of the questions was about the vaccine and how it might affect PLA2 levels and mitochondrial functions. So the, the questioner asked about both. Yeah, and I, I so, you know, I'm unfortunate in that my, my postulates, my hypotheses are correct a good number of time, but boy, it wasn't correct this time. I mean, I, I thought the vaccination was going to generate a, you know, a little immune response and we'd see a little SPLA2 being released and, and, and that would be part of the inflammatory response to vaccination. Uh, at least in the eight individuals in which we've looked at it uh, so far, it's going in the opposite direction, which in and of itself is fascinating because if vaccination somehow prevents its release, then that could potentially be how it, it I mean, these vaccinations are preventing people from dying. I mean, period. That's, you know, that's how they, they work. They prevent people from ending up in the ICU. And so, so it's just uh, more, more research that we have to do. Along those lines, uh... Are there experimental systems like mouse models where one could look at um, the effects of uh, COVID and, and PLA2 and, and actually get to some of the mechanistic or causation that's, uh, that you're hypothesizing? Yeah, so we, you have to be careful with, with, with mice because there are these frame shift mutations in mice and, and so the SPLA2 is not active in many, many strains of mice. It is active in a couple of strains of mice. So you have to be really careful with the mice studies. But we, we now are, um, are interacting with Curtis Thorne in, in the cancer center. He grows organoids um, uh, and he, uh, we, we now have, uh, have found a I want this nerve uh, innervating skeletal muscle uh, organoid. And, and there's an organoid that was just published in Nature Medicine, which is a spinal cord nerves that innervate um, skeletal muscle. Uh, providing SPLA2 to that organoid and kind of microscopically and biochemically understanding what that's doing both to the nerve and the muscle uh, is going to be fascinating, especially in terms of long COVID. Uh, that um, uh, Curtis also has respiratory epithelial cells in one of the only labs in the country who's, who's virally infecting these respiratory epithelial cells. So what 
you know, is that SPLA2 being released from, from these, uh, uh, these uh, respiratory epithelial cells, th those would be thought to be the first cells that, uh, that you would get. So is SPLA2 being released? And very similar to, to some studies I used to do in mast cells, um, what does the SPLA2, for me, why is the SPLA2 being released? I mean, does it have some function against the virus? I mean, we know it has a function to kill bacteria, gram-positive bacteria, but is it, is there a disease-resistant part of this that that, that SPLA2 is somehow, you know, somehow interacting with the ACE receptor or or the viral particle to prevent infection. We just don't have our arms around that, but we we do. Uh, Curtis does have a model with with respiratory epithelial cells that he infects with live virus. So we'll be able to answer a lot of those questions. There are a couple more questions here, and I had one that I didn't want to forget to ask, and that is your your cohort does not include asymptomatics, and forty percent of infected are asymptomatic. Does that provide you with an angle, a research angle? Well, we certainly, we certainly want to know the answer to that. We want to know, you know, uh, I mean, we obviously expect it to, you know, the mild have very low levels of this. We expect it to look like the mild, uh, but, but that being said, we won't know until we test. Uh, um, I think it's a very, very important uh, question. When we first got these samples, we were so fortunate to have our Stony Brook colleagues. We, it wasn't fortunate that it was killing so many people in New York, but to get these 360 some samples and to begin this work was, we're so fortunate and blessed to have been able to get that because, but, even in getting those samples, these doctors were taking this blood in an incredibly chaotic manner. I mean, it was just, so it, 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 it was not an option early on to, to get uh, the asymptomatic individuals. We were simply, you know, we were getting what was coming out of the ICU. Right. Right, it may be hard to get those asymptomatic samples. Yeah. Because um, yeah, I wonder if they have, you know, something different about their mitochondrial uh, functionality or something that protects them. Um, you do have a, a, someone fr congratulating you and say, saying your friends at Western Carolina University are very proud of you. Oh, my goodness. They, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm severely dyslexic. I'm going to tell a teeny little story. Uh, but I'm severely dyslexic and I couldn't read coming out of high school. I, seriously, I could not read. And Western Carolina uh, was, so again, that gives you about a hundred on the reading part of your SAT. And so I was a college athlete, a pole vaulter and, and Western Carolina took a chance on me. And by the end of that, uh, I went straight to Wake Forest and was so fortunate to get a PhD in three years, but if it had not been for my friends at Western Carolina, uh, I wouldn't be sitting here giving this talk right now. Well, we're running out of time, but I did want to end with one interesting question that you, you could answer, and that is, uh, I'll read it directly. You did a great job explaining the progress of your research in terms of the process of science. What advice uh, would you have for a student interest, uh, a researcher who has a new interest in biochemistry through their interest in COVID? You know, as you know, I write these silly little books and, <laughs> and, and right now I'm writing my sixth one called There Is Another Way and I'm writing a chapter right now on, on first principles and understanding first principles. The reason I love biochemistry so much is it's at the root cause. It's uh, so it's a first principle. We get so enamored by looking at the complexity of human diseases. We look, we're looking at every angle of them and it's, it's, it's just what we want to do. We want to just look out in all the different aspects. But 
to be able to come to meaningful solutions that will have therapies, one has to get to the root cause. And inflammation is a great example of that. Inflammation is the root cause of whatever, a hundred diseases. So, you know, so, so my answer to the aspiring young biochemist, and it makes me happy to hear that, uh, is that, that ask the right questions. And if you ask the right questions, your biochemistry will take you to a root cause, root causes. And from root causes, uh, everything will be okay for you. You'll have a good career. Well, we're right at six o'clock. There are a few more questions, but um, I think I'll leave it to the organizers to decide what we should do. Well, I, I see it's six o'clock and it's about time for us to wrap up. So um, we're unfortunately out of time for this evening, but I really thank you everybody in the audience for your really insightful questions. And thank you again, uh, Dr. Chilton for your presentation. So uh, please join us for the next installment of our Bio5 Precision Wellness in the Time of COVID-19 Symposium. Our next one is going to feature Dr. Yves Lussier on May 17th. For more information on the Precision Wellness Initiative and our upcoming speakers, visit the website address um, that I think we'll put up in the chat. And um, or it's actually on our screen as well. And so you can uh, see that. Hope to see you at the next one. And everybody have a wonderful evening. Thank you again.